You're my confidence. I'm all the things you associate with confidence, King. <laughs> You're my paranoia. Isn't that a urine stain on the front of your trousers? I mean, Rob was right in, in terms of not meeting an alien of the week or a monster of the week or landing on a planet is that it would force us to come up with something original. And what it forced us to do was instead of looking outward, uh, it made us look inward into the characters. We're both uh, fascinated by psychology and what makes us all tick. And uh, we, we both nearly did it at universe. I say nearly, we actually went and were supposed to be doing it. But that we were very interested in, in, in that, uh, that kind of thing. Confidence and paranoia kind of did tap into a theme we were going to go back to and back to, though we didn't know it, of the psyche made real. You can do anything. Anything. <laughs> I think Paul Jackson uh, recommended Craig Ferguson. I didn't know him. When I say nobody calls me Fergie, Craig calls me Fergie. <laughs> Craig was a very confident person, you know, he was right for that role, he was great. He is confident, he is energetic, he's big, he's happy. Apart from an actor, he's a stand-up comedian, very good one, with that kind of Scottish bigness. Not bigness in size, but in, in performance. Oh, look! You've got a body like a coat hanger! How can you make an evening suit? Shit! <laughs> How can I make an evening suit shit? <laughs> Why do Scottish people do brilliant American accents? But have you noticed that? Scottish people do brilliant American accents. There was a couple of people we auditioned for that part, and one of them was Mac McDonald. But we thought Mac would have been a great confidence, but we didn't want to lose him as the captain. So maybe at one stage, Craig Ferguson could have become the captain, who knows? Again, like Craig Ferguson for confidence, for paranoia, Lee was absolutely perfect. You know, if anyone's going to remind you of that spot you have, you know, it's just that character. Lee, I knew a lot, uh, was a great friend. He'd been in um, The Young Ones, and also he did the warm-up in The Young Ones, and he was fantastic. Lee Korn's another person on the circuit, comedian, who was uh, in a group called The Wow Show. Uh, he was right for paying miserable, you know, paranoid people. It was perfect. That's me. That's how I was. That's me. Yes, that's right. He, he was the opposite of, of Craig. Healthy, you know, white teeth, tan, larger than life. And this guy was sort of just really into himself and nasty and creepy. Uh, and again, typecasting, I dare say. His whole comic being, if you like, is, is sort of trades on being a small man. He used to host the comedy store and he played a character where he would come on as a sort of rather unpleasant MC. And as the show went on, he would come with more and more damage done to him. So the next time he'd introduce would be some blood coming out of his nose, inferring that he'd, somebody had smacked him in the face backstage. And by the end of it, he's covered in bruises, there's blood everywhere, and you know, that's the kind of character he played, where he was just irritating and everybody wanted to beat him senseless. He was a very serious contender for Rimmer at the time. Uh, not at that time, but obviously uh, when we were casting. And so we, we were on the lookout for a, a meaty part for him. I saw it recently and thought, yeah, you know, quite enjoyed what I did. I mean, I looked so ghastly. I mean, they didn't have to do much makeup on me to make me look sort of that, that drawn. I thought, how, obviously, how young and thin I was. But, uh, yeah, I was quite pleased with that. I, I don't, sometimes you can look at yourself and go, oh, dear, oh, dear. But, you know, I was, I was pleased with that. <laughs> a gantry was, to say the very least, jury-rigged around that scene. And we quite literally stood up there with buckets of fish that had been bought that day from the fish market. And we left these in the cooling environment of a Manchester studio for most of the day. So they'd been up there all day and just basically part cooking. So you had this sort of semi-cooked fish smell, which, you know, frozen fish smell is all right. And the cooked fish smell is all right, but the in-between one, and then I had to take a shot of a live fish on the floor, flapping about, like they do when they're... And I remember taking a shot of it, going, I haven't quite got enough. And Paul Jackson, he who is so tough, went, that's enough, put the fish back in the bucket. Wouldn't have happened with an actor. They'd have been left to flap about until they were dead. <laughs> The Mayor of Warsaw spontaneously combusted. This was simply a, a rollback and mix camera gag. 
you do a lock off. So the guy comes in, he rings the bell, and at the particular point, we cut, ask the man to move, and then you fire off an explosion. You get his clothes, you hang them on a wire, and you drop the clothes. And then always for good measure, you take a shot of the clothes on the floor landing on a heap. And that's how you blow somebody up. Please note the dust storm is approaching. Ship exterior is now out of bounds. All airlocks are being automatically sealed. We had to um, provide a sort of POV shot of the dust storm in space approaching the ship. So um, at the time, I think we'd been messing around with water tanks for some nuclear explosions for aliens. We'd had a four foot square tank made up, which we filled with water. And at the back of the tank, um, we have a little probe which we squirt Jay's fluid through. And that goes towards lens and it spreads out through the water and looks like um, some kind of gas cloud or whatever you like to call it. And then we basically chopped off the back end of the Red Dwarf spaceship and stood it on the floor on its end and then dropped vermiculite, little particles of mica, lots of dust in it. And uh, as we tracked the camera down, the Red Dwarf spaceship appeared to be flying left to right. You don't need anything, King. You're the king. You're crazy. If you're on the outside of Red Dwarf, it's an enormous ship, isn't it? And it's very difficult to uh, give that impression really in the studio. And I sent the buyer out to get some rolls of paper, you know, the big rolls. And uh, I got our painter, Bert, to sort of pour some red paint on. And you know what? It wasn't grey. It was red because it was the outside of Red Dwarf. We got away from the grey and all of a sudden everyone was like, had a song in their heart and a smile on their face. Paul designed the set against um, the sound gallery wall and the stairs that they came down were the actual stairs from the sound gallery. Of course, the vision mixer sort of managed to double that up by pushing a few buttons. And um, dropped them in on the edit into a bigger shot and then the close-up was actually done on the studio floor. Craig Confidence uh, was simply directed to walk along the gallery and position himself in a specific point. And at that point, we could cut and lock off. We then took him out, and it took quite a long time to do this change because we then had to take a panel away and bring an air mortar up behind and charge it and load it with debris and put in an empty space suit which was connected to the air mortar. And once everything was ready, we simply rolled the cameras again and fired the button and everything went bang at the same time. The secret is, is to make the explosion happen very, very close to the edit. So you have normal person, normal person, explosion, straight away afterwards. So you, you, you don't see much of the dummy. And that was a great special effect where it exploded and I got injured. I got hit by bits of things, so when you see me falling like that, that's because I got I, I, I caught a little bit, you know what I mean? All my old stunts. The original ending to Confidence and Paranoia was uh, Lister gets Holly to power down uh, unnecessary resources and uh, he has enough power then to generate another hologram and it was going to be Kachansky and it was because it was the uh, sort of the final show of the first season we thought oh well you know uh, that'll it's kind of a bit of a cliffhanger we want people to think what's going to happen next. It was only after the hiatus and uh, we were sort of sitting in the office talking about the series. And I said, you know what we should have done at the end of that? We should have brought back Rimmer instead. And Doug said, you're right, let's write it. And I say, you, you're mad. We've got six shows. We're not going to get paid anymore. <laughs> why, why would we do that? And, uh, but we did. And uh, it turns out that knocked out the second show we'd written, which featured two listers. But it had the same theme, which is, you know, how would you get on with yourself? And that new show was Me Squared, which obviously had the benefit of of what we'd seen in rehearsals, and I'm sure the shows would have continued to get stronger, and we would have knocked out at least Waiting for God and probably at least one more if we'd had just a few more weeks. But um, unfortunately, we didn't spend that summer as wisely as we might have done. Do you honestly think I'd put Kachansky's disc in Kachansky's box where any munchkin could find it? You, you think you had, had it bad, bad before, before Lister. Lister. You've now got you've it got it in stereo, stereo baby. 
Welcome aboard, Rimsey. A <laughs> pleasure to be here, you old munchkin, you. Nah, f it, we'll, we'll do it again and we'll just. just uh, saying the lie is going to be too difficult to do.